Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society. My name is Kanesor in Wall Street Channel. I am the Director of Research here at the MHS. I'm filling in for Gavin Cleespees, our Director of Public Programs. And it's my pleasure to do so because this is a fantastic project and a fantastic book, and I have a great deal of interest in Daniel Webster. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, the Massachusetts Historical Society is the first historical society in the nation. We were founded in 1791, and we are still collecting to this day. We have 14 million manuscript pages, including the papers of John and John Quincy Adams, the personal papers of Thomas Jefferson, but we also have papers of uh, environmental activists and, and soldiers and nurses and for folks from all aspects of American life. And we have thousands of artifacts and paintings as well. And the person who we have the most of, most paintings of, just happens to be the subject of today's book, Daniel Webster. And there's a painting of Chester Hard <laughs> by Chester Harding uh, of Mr. Webster right there today. The Massachusetts Historical Society is free and open to the public. Anyone can walk in and take a look at some of our founding documents. We are only able to offer this service because of the support of our members. If you are interested in becoming a member of the MHS, we urge you to check out our website, masshist.org, to see how you can be part of this. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Uh, they will be engaged in conversation for about 45 minutes. And after that, we shall take questions from the audience. And for those of you in the room, I'll walk around with a microphone. So please wait for the microphone to reach you before you ask your questions so that folks online can also hear them as well. And folks online, you're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A box and Olivia will ask them at the end of the program. All right, let's get to the introductions. It is our pleasure to introduce and welcome to the MHS, Joel Richard Paul. He is a professor of law at the University of California Law School in San Francisco, where he teaches courses on constitutional law, international economic law, and foreign relations law. Professor Paul has also taught at the University of California at Berkeley, at Yale University, as well as the University of Connecticut, among other places. He is the author of Unlikely Allies, Our Merchant, a playwright and a spy saved the American Revolution, which the eminent historian Gordon Wood declared, quote, an engaging and an entertaining account of three of the most colorful characters involved in the American Revolution. It is hard to believe that their story is true, but it is. He's also the author of Without Precedent, Chief Justice John Marshall and His Times, of which Harvard Law School Professor Lawrence Tribe wrote, I would have predicted that there was nothing worth saying about John Marshall that hadn't already been said. I would have been wrong. Uh, in every chapter of this page-turning account of Marshall's pivotal place in our nation's history, even the expert will learn something new. And he is here to talk about his latest book today, Indivisible, Daniel Webster and the Birth of American Nationalism. Professor Paul will be joined in conversation by Jan Sar Saragoni, she is president of Saragoni and Company, a Boston-based communications consultancy. Uh, Ms. Saragoni is a former correspondent of the Associated Press and is active in many educational and nonprofit organizations, such as the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, the Boston Public Market, the Kennedy School of Government Magazine, and UNICEF's Children First Speakers Program. Welcome to you both. Hello, Joel. Hey, Jan. You know, when you were telling friends and family and colleagues about doing this biography of Webster, did many people say, you mean the dictionary guy? Why would you, why would you write a book about him? So uh, Daniel Webster, known as the greatest orator of his time, uh, some say perhaps too overlooked in history, but what, what inspired you to tell his story? With Daniel Webster, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you all for, for being here. I, and it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for your kind introduction, kid. I, uh, Daniel Webster has been in a bad odor for a long time uh, because of his role in the Compromise of 1850, which we'll talk about a little bit later, I suspect. Uh, but I, I'm kind of I, I like to sort of unearth interesting characters, as as kids suggested, and 
to try to um, suggest a different way of looking at their stories. Daniel Webster is a particularly important figure. He was, he was the central character uh, in the politics that preceded the Civil War. Uh, he was really the spokesperson for the North. He was the conscience of the North. He was a guy who um, really was one of the first polit major political figures to come out to condemn uh, slavery from the North. Uh, he was uh, a congressman. He was a senator. Uh, he was a, um, a frequent presidential candidate, unsuccessfully. He was twice Secretary of State. But what makes him so interesting to me is he was the greatest orator of the 19th century and recognized so not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And um, I wanted to sort of understand why he was so significant, what, what it was about his oratory and how his oratory really shaped the way we think about ourselves today as Americans. And my book is really about more than Daniel Webster. It's really about the story of, of how we became Americans. Tell us a bit about uh, his life. Where was he born? What was his family like? How did how did he become uh, who he was? And where did he develop this incredible oratorical skill? Right. So he he came from a very modest family in New Hampshire. Uh, his dad was a not particularly successful farmer, um, and uh, he had he had ten brothers and sisters, I believe. Um, Webster um, was a somewhat sickly child, and he he um, showed a great deal of uh, interest in books as a young man. And his father decided that he would send his his son to a Phillips Academy. Uh, and so um, he sends his son to Phillips Academy uh, at great expense. He had to mortgage his house, his farm, to do this sends his son to Phillips Academy, and his son gets there. And, and as a young man, I think he was age 15 or 16 at the time, uh, he was expected to stand up and recite. And the first time he's called on to stand up and recite one of the other boys, uh, he panics, he freezes, he can't, he, he, he can't say anything. Uh, he's so terrified. And He's, he feels so humiliated by this experience. And then he's basically sent out. He's, he's sent back. And he feels terrible because, of course, his father has gone to all this great expense and trouble to send him for an education. So he, he gets a tutor. And he's determined. He's determined to become an orator. He's determined to become someone who can stand up before an audience and speak. And he succeeds because he has this remarkable, capacious memory. He has, he has the ability to memorize 70 passages in the Bible and recite them by heart. Uh, he has just remarkable capacity for memorization that makes it possible for him to learn whole speeches and recite them back. Uh, and uh, by the time he's ready to go to college, uh, his father sends him to Dartmouth. Um, and he's not a particularly successful student in any respect, except for the fact that he becomes the greatest orator at the college. Uh, and he, he gives the speech on class day when everyone graduates. And people start talking about the fact that this kid has this just remarkable capacity for expressing himself uh, with, you know, extemporaneously without any kind of notes, just, just from the heart. Um, and that's kind of the beginning of his of his legendary career as, as an orator. Can you speak a bit about his his physical appearance too? He seemed to have a presence. Well, you you can see him right over there uh, in that portrait. He he had uh, a remarkable kind of presence. He was um, he was not particularly tall, but people had the impression of a much taller man because he had a, a kind of a abnormally large sized head. And, and a very broad forehead. And what is he, it wasn't his brain when he died, his brain was weighed. And it yes. turns out that his brain literally weighed more than- Than any that. other human brain anyone had weighed prior, prior to that. In fact, I, I, to my, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but, to, but from what I have read, the only person who, whose brain has been weighed more than Webster's brain was in fact Einstein. 
Wow. And how did that compare? Einstein won. I <laughs> won. Uh, uh, but but so Webster Webster had these very dark, intense eyes that people found um, either sort of hypnotic or a little bit satan satanic. Um, uh, he was unusually dark skinned for someone who grew up in New England, um, and he he looked uh, uh, somewhat like he might have been from another culture. Um, and he had this sort of very dark black hair and people referred to him as Black Dan. And it had, it was both a comment on his physical appearance, but also on the nation that there was something about him that seemed a little bit satanic, uh, that, that he, he just didn't seem like other people. And, 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 and this, I think physical, uh, these physical characteristics made it possible for him to stand up before an audience with enormous power, uh, even before he opened his mouth and just command audiences in a way that uh, people felt mesmerized. And he could speak for four hours at a time. He could speak, uh, well, his most famous speech, the second reply to Senator Hain, goes for two days. Uh, many of his speeches run 60 or 70 published pages. And these speeches, as I said, were given um, extemporaneously. He just, he, he memorized large portions of them, but a lot of them were just, I think, on the spot. Uh, and when you read his speeches, the language is, say, Shakespearean. Uh, it doesn't, it's not the kind of language we would ordinarily use. His command of English was, was remarkable. And he, um, he was very theatrical in his production. He would start, start out his speeches by speaking very softly to kind of get everyone's attention, looking down at his shoes. And then he would raise this enormous head up and his voice would come booming out. And he had this kind of, his voice was like a church organ. Uh, people said it could fill not just a room, but he could speak outdoors before crowds of thousands of people. And everyone in the crowd claimed that they heard hear every word that he, he, he uttered. Um, and the most remarkable instance of that being at Bunker Hill. Uh, in 18, 1825, he gives, he gives the speech at the dedication of Bunker Hill. And uh, this is when uh, Lafayette returns to America on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. And it is the largest crowd anyone had ever seen in America filling the streets of Boston. Tens of, there were tens of thousands of people, everybody in Boston is on the streets cheering uh, Lafayette, who was, who was seen as the sort of spiritual son of George Washington. Uh, he embodied the American Revolution more than any other man. And, and people were cheering this hero and they go up to the hill and uh, Webster gives this address uh, uh, at the dedication, and there are allegedly ten to twenty thousand people who are standing on the hillside, and the, and there's like a little theater that's been erected, and they have um, some some seating, some uh, seating that's been set up kind of temporarily for women uh, to sit underneath a canopy so that they wouldn't get sunburned in the in the in the heat of summer. And he starts speaking and the crowd is so excited that they start pushing forward and they knock down all the seating and this canopy falls on top of all the ladies. And there's just complete pandemonium. People are running around screaming, people are injured. Uh, it's, it's just a mess. And the city marshal says to, says to Webster, well, you know, there's nothing we can do, it's over. Uh, it's, it's not possible. And uh, Webster says to him, nothing is impossible. And in this scene of, of complete bedlam, Webster just stands up and just booms out, be silent. And the whole crowd stops what they're doing. And people sit down and they pull the canopy away and the women get up and they brush themselves off and they, everybody finds a seat and they continue. A and that incident contributes to the reputation of the man who became known as Godlike Dan. 
God like Daniel was 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 the was the other version of Daniel Webster apart from the Black Dan legend. And God like Daniel, because he had the voice of God, people said. Or what was perceived to be the voice of, of God. How does how does Webster's legacy resonate today? And is it an exaggeration to say that he embodied or laid the foundation for what it means or maybe meant to be an American? Well, you know, when you think back to what the Republic was uh, at, at, at our beginning, uh, people did not think of themselves as Americans. We were Massachusetts people. We were, we were um, Virginians. We were New Yorkers. People didn't have any experience of what it would mean to be an American. Being an American was a theory. It wasn't a reality. Uh, people would live their whole lives within a 50 mile radius of their homes. Uh, they didn't travel very far. They didn't know what was life like in Virginia. If you lived in Massachusetts your whole life, that's, where you, that's all you knew. And when we declared independence, we were declaring independence as 13 separate nations that just happened to have certain common interests. But each of the states uh, really conducted their own foreign relations, their own trade relations. They had their own tariffs. Um, we were not really a nation at that time. Uh, Justice John Rutledge, the Supreme Court, um, once commented that when the framers of our constitution got together, they thought that what they were going to do was to eliminate barriers to trade among the 13, among the states. Um, and they only created a nation by accident. And so, so people did not think of themselves as Americans. And when Crève Coeur, the famous French writer writes, you know, what is an American then? Uh, that is a legitimate question. Uh, it's like when the, uh, European states formed the European uh, Union. They didn't think of themselves as Europeans overnight. They still don't necessarily think of themselves as Europeans. And so there were these contending ideas of what it meant to be an American. And, those, and, and a lot of what the book is about is those different contending ideas of what it means to be an American. Would, would, would those ideas include you were American if you lived on the land, if you took the land? Uh, uh, Americans maybe weren't considered uh, to be Mexicans or indigenous people. How did the idea of an American as opposed to a Virginian come about? So you have these conflicting ideas. You have this idea, um, uh, I attribute to, to Henry Clay, that, that basically <clears throat> um, you are, you, the way in which we will create an American nation is through infrastructure, through trade, through business, through investment. Uh, and that slowly over time, kind of the way the European Union develops from the uh, European coal and steel community and then the European common market and so forth, this sort of like this, this slow integration of the economy will create an American nation. And then you have John Quincy Adams who thinks, well, it's the territory, the land that defines us as Americans. And uh, John, people don't realize this about John Quincy Adams. He's, he's the guy who originated the notion of manifest destiny. He, he actually, uh, he, he, he is the person who writes um, uh, the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe gets all the credit, but John Quincy Adams as Secretary of State wrote the Monroe Doctrine. His view was, we, God has given us this continent from ocean to ocean, and it's all ours. And these other guys who are in the way, they're just sort of obstacles. We have to get around the, you know, those Native American tribes and the, and the Mexicans or other people who are in, in our land. And then you have the notion of a group of writers known as the Young America Movement, uh, people like Nathaniel Hawthorne and John O'Sullivan, um, Walt Whitman later on, uh, Herman Melville for a time, uh, James Fenimore Cooper, who, who all imagined that the way in which you become a nation is through your culture. You, have, you develop a common literature, 
you develop a certain kinds of art and, and that those things knit you together as a nation. But the prevalent idea is the idea of Andrew Jackson, that what defines us as a nation is our race, that we are, we are Americans because we're white, we're European, and we're presumptively Christian. And, and, and that is what defines you as an American. And so, you know, these, these Native Americans, they don't belong here. These Mexicans, they don't belong here. That anyone who isn't white does not belong here. They're not Americans and certainly not the enslaved people of, uh, of the South. So it's against that that Daniel Webster pushes his idea. And his idea is that what defines us as Americans is the Constitution itself, that the Constitution makes us all Americans, regardless of our race, regardless of our ethnicity, the region of the country we're from. We are all Americans as of the day the Constitution became a Constitution. The ratification of the Constitution made us a nation, period. And that idea is so common to us now that we don't, we just sort of accept it as gospel. But at the time, it was a radical transformative idea. And, and it was the power of Webster's oratory that made us Americans. So that would be constitutional nationalism? Constitu what I call constitutional nationalism. National. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what was his first, uh, what, what, propelled him into public life? What did he run for first? Well, what propels him to, to uh, it's kind of an incredible story. So he is um, he's a young man. He's an attorney in practice in, uh, outside of Portsmouth. And um, he gets invited to give the July 4th speech in Portsmouth. And uh, it's, the year is 1812, uh, where that canon is from. And um, the War of 1812, the so-called Madison's War, is extremely unpopular in New England because it basically closed down uh, all of our shipping. And uh, this young man uh, gets up before an audience in Portsmouth and he gives this speech where he just rips apart President Madison and he and he attacks the war and basically says this war is a fraud, that the war is being fraught, fought on the false idea that it is to protect American shipping <clears throat> from the interference of the British ships. But in fact, it's killing American shipping. And the real purpose of this war was that Westerners led by Henry Clay wanted to attach Canada. The whole purpose of the war was actually to invade Canada and try to seize Canada. Not very successfully, by the way. <laughs> and it wasn't the first time we tried to seize Canada. But, but, but Webster kind of like, just he, he blows people away with his speech. And they decide, we got to get this guy elected to Congress. And he gets elected the next election to Congress from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So he goes to, he goes to Congress. Uh, and he's sort of known as this radical anti-war guy. Um, he, you know, he's sort of the Bernie Sanders of the of of, of the moment. And and um, but he's this incredible orator. Uh, and then his next kind of you know he he serves for a couple of terms in, in from New Hampshire, and then he decides he he wants to expand his his. His, uh, his law practice and moves here to Boston. Uh, and um, he's in Boston and he's invited to give the speech at Plymouth in 1820 when uh, on the anniversary of the arrival of the, the pilgrims in Plymouth. So um, he treks up to Plymouth, passes Marshfield on the way and decides he wants to build a house in Marshfield someday and, and, and gets to Plymouth and he gives this speech, which is really quite remarkable, where he, um, he does something that I, the only other person I know who does this is Frederick Douglass. He turns on the audience and attacks the audience. And he does so by saying, slavery is something which is unworthy of the descendants of the pilgrims, that you people, may think this is the South's problem, but it's your problem because you're profiting 
from the slave trade. You're profiting from the ships you build and from the uh, uh, materials you you process, you know, the your your cotton mills, whatever you're whatever you're doing that is using raw materials from the South, you're helping the South and the Southern slaveocracy to stay in business. So, and so your he, response. Was, he was the first, and I'm struck by this, forgive me for interrupting, but it, it seems until then, the North felt sort of insulated from that, that ugly right, reality right. that our industry right. was providing clothing that the enslaved were wearing to pick cotton. And and, and that was and, the and first we were literally time. building the chains. Literally. It was changing people. And ensuring the cargo of right. enslaved people. Uh, but but before he gave that speech, was that, were the abolitionists even talking about that? Or was he the first? Well, so the abolitionists were very, at that at that point in time in 1820, the abolitionists weren't particularly strong. They were just a bunch of radical hippie types. Mm-hmm. You know, they were not, they were kind of on the fringe. Right. Uh, and uh, they became stronger over time. But we have to distinguish between two groups of people, people who are abolitionists and people who are anti-slavery. Abolitionists are people who wanted to abolish slavery today, immediately, right now. They had absolutely no practical idea of how to get there or what happens next. What were we going to do with these people? You can't just tell enslaved people, okay, you're free now, go home. Go home where? What are we supposed to do with them? So they didn't really have a solution to the problem. They were simply identifying the problem. The anti-slavery people believed in gradual manumission and some kind of a program, they were kind of vague about it, but they had some idea that over time, we kind of squeeze the South, we squeeze the slaveholders, we get them to stop. You know, we we stop the slave trade, we try to maybe designate land that will be reserved for the enslaved people. We try to raise money to buy their freedom. Um, and, and Webster was never an abolitionist, nor was Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln and Webster were both anti-slavery. And I'm reminded of something that we're reminded of throughout your book, uh, as we discuss Webster's significance in American history, but liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable, inspired, it's, you, you write, the union's resolve to defeat the secessionists. Prior to world, uh, prior to the, the Civil War, yeah. So, so that line, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable, is sort of the Webster's tagline. It's it's the line he's most famous for, and it comes about. Uh, uh, he's a senator from Massachusetts, elected to the Senate after his speech at Plymouth, uh, and he goes to the Senate and. Um, uh, there's a sl- Senator uh, Hayne from South Carolina who is a radical pro-Southern, pro- pro-slavery Southerner um, spewing racism and accusing Massachusetts and other uh, Northern New England uh, states uh, of, try- of trying to impoverish the South by trying to squeeze slavery and other, and through tariffs, protecting their industries at the expense of the South. And um, Webster gives this reply, he gives a series of replies, and it's the second reply to Senator Hayne, where he sort of, he has entrapped Senator Hayne into trying to defend John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun at the time is vice president of the United States. Calhoun has this theory of nullification, this idea that the states are all free. You know, this, this constitution is, you know, it's just kind of a, a compact. It's just an agreement among states to sort of do some things together when they feel like it, but it's not really all that important. And if the states don't want to listen to federal law, we don't have to listen to federal law. We can nullify federal law. If we feel like we're done with the union, we can withdraw anytime we want to. It's just a contract. That's 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 Calhoun's theory. And, and, and Webster gets... Senator Hayne to basically defend that theory in, in, in the Senate. And Calhoun is sitting on the, on the dais as the vice president of the United States. And this is Webster's most glorious moment. He gets up and he delivers a speech that goes on for two days. I won't read it all to you. Um, <laughs> and he, he, he gets up and he gives this speech 
where he basically says that the Constitution has to be more than a contract, that, it, that, it, that, that the Constitution is a transformative document. It's a living, breathing, organic expression of the will of the American people. It is not an agreement among states. It's an agreement among all the American people. And we all agree to be bound to this union. And at the end of this long, long speech, which is very funny in parts, um, but not funny enough to read the whole thing. Uh, and and he, he, at the end of this, at the end of the speech, he says, um, liberty and union now and forever, one and inseparable. And, and when he says this, you have to understand as the, as the, as an opponent of slavery, he understands that at that point, about 20% of the American people are not free. They are enslaved. But he, what he's saying in the speech is that in order to free the slaves, in order to make it possible for everyone to be free, we have to stay unified. We have to stay as one country. The union was the vehicle for ending slavery. Now, that idea, uh, as we'll talk about, ultimately runs into a collision course because union and, and freedom for the slaves uh, finally become uh, irreconcilable when it comes to the Compromise of 1850. And this leads us to the Compromise of 1850, which you argue, and others have, that that was the beginning of the demise of his political career. Is that too broad a statement? Oh, there's no doubt it was the end of his political career. Uh, he, um, and explain what that was right, exactly. Right, right, right. So for those of you who, who don't remember, the 1850 compromise uh, occurs because um, it's kind of our fault in California. 1849. Um, so many things are, by the way. Yes, really, yeah. Uh, you know, there's the discovery of gold in California. And all of a sudden, thousands of people are, trans are, are, are crossing the country at great risk to show up in California for the gold rush. All of a sudden, California is like hot property. It was not hot real estate before then at all. It was basically considered just sort of desert, not very inhabitable by anybody. The discovery of gold in California means two things. It means, first of all, that it becomes very desirable to want to make Make California into the into, bring California into the union, but also it means that it is very risky not to bring it into the union because it becomes a target for the Mexicans and the Spanish and the Russians and the British and all of whom had claims on California. So it is essential that we get California. Gold is, gold is the basis of our economy. I mean, that, that is the currency. We need California. But at the time, there's 12 slave states and there's 12 free states. And the free states uh, have a majority of the population. So in the House of Representatives, the majority of Congress members are from free states. Slave states are at a disadvantage in the House of Representatives. But in the Senate, there's an equal number of free and slave states so that they can balance each other. And if we admit California as a free state, then it throws the balance out. It means that the free states now have enough power that they can end slavery. So um, slave states are threatening to secede. And it's getting very frightening. I mean, the slave states are, are very serious about it. South Carolina is you know, getting ready to declare independence and other Southern states are expected to follow. And in the middle of a snowstorm uh, on a December night, Henry Clay comes to Webster's home. Uh, and Henry Clay at the time is dying. He's an elderly man. He's in terrible shape. He comes to Webster's home. And Webster and Clay are, are rivals for power. Um, they, they run against each other for president numerous times at that point. And they were not friends, but they were, they saw the necessity to cooperate sometime. Clay is the representative of the West. Uh, Webster represents the North. And then you've got Calhoun representing the South. And so it's necessary for Clay and Webster to cooperate sometimes. And, and Clay says, I've got this idea. And the idea is complicated, but the basic idea is 
we get the South to agree to admit California as a free state. And in exchange, the Northern states pledge that they will enforce the fugitive slave laws, which up until that time, nobody had ever really enforced. The constitution requires the North uh, to return fugitive slaves, but we had ignored that because when every time a fugitive slave got brought before a, a Massachusetts a jury, the jury would say, ah, you know, we, you know, we don't think he's a slave and they'd let him go free. And so in order to make this happen, to make this enforceable, Clay comes up with the idea, we'll take this out of the state courts and out of federal courts, we'll appoint special magistrates that will just hear slave cases. And the magistrate will be appointed in every major you know, city in the North. And the magistrate will have the power to just order the slave return to the slaveholder without any trial, without any due process, without any attorneys involved. Um, and we'll pay the magistrate double if he sends the slave back rather than if he frees the slaves. So there were so no pro bono- financial incentive to return the slaves. Excuse me, so there were no pro bono attorneys at the time saying, coming forth and saying, we will represent well, the they, slave. They, they, we yeah, there were, there were many, uh, uh, but they wouldn't allow them. They wouldn't allow any, any sort of legal representation. There was no, you had no right to cross-examine witnesses. There was no, pro- there was no process at all. It was just, you know, some guy stands up and says this, this black person is mine, is my property. And then the magistrate says, okay, yep, get on the ship. And, uh, and Webster is really torn because he knows that the only way that the North will ever agree to the compromise is if Webster endorses it because he's the leader, he's the, he's the spokesperson. If he endorses it, it'll, it'll pass narrowly. If he opposes it, it will fail and the union will fail. And here are the two great principles of his life, the union and opposition to slavery. What is he going to do? And after about a month or two of just being torn apart, and he knows it means the end of his political ambitions. Webster gives this speech on March 7th, 1850, where he basically comes out and endorses the compromise. And um, uh, he turns to his Northern colleagues and says, you're all hypocrites. You know, you, you condemn the South, but you, you know, you, and, and, and you, you know, you waive your constitutions, but look in the constitution's text. The constitution's text doesn't just allow slavery, it protects slavery, it preserves slavery. It guarantees the right of the slave states to have slavery. And, um, you know, we, we, we have an obligation to return the fugitive slaves. We may not like to do this, but this is what we have to do. And he reminds them the only way to end slavery is through the union. And, you know, basically he has cut his throat and that's the end of his political career, his electoral career. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that also, uh, up until then, Emerson was one of his biggest uh, fans and admirers. And the quote from Emerson that, that is so... Uh, Interesting, uh, goes like this. Uh, Emerson wrote that, describing describing Webster, the word liberty in the mouth of Mr. Webster sounds like the word love in the mouth of course. Talking about how, how could he talk about liberty when he is uh, complicit in this in this nefarious? Uh, yeah, he, he's just roundly condemned, condemned by all of the people who once thought him a great a great man. Uh, uh, John uh, uh, John Greenleaf Whittier writes this poem uh, called Icarus, where he basically says that the man is dead, the man has lost his faith, the man is dead, and. Um, uh, Theodore Parker, the great, the great Congregationalist minister, um, gives this eulogy when Webster dies later on. And in his eulogy on Webster, which goes on, it's, it's a whole book. It's a whole book that, are, that, he, that he writes over a weekend in Concord. And he, he, writes, this, he writes this book and he basically says um, that, that Webster is a man without a soul. Uh, that, that he's he's betrayed everything he ever stood for, um, and it, it's 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 really remarkable how his friends abandoned him. 
But the one person who doesn't abandon him is the president of the United States, Millard Fillmore. Um, and Millard Fillmore realizes that now he's got to enforce the fugitive slave laws that have now been adopted by Congress. And the only man to do it is Daniel Webster. So he gives Daniel Webster a way of exiting gracefully from the Senate by appointing him Secretary of State for the second time. And the Secretary of State at the time is the guy who has to enforce all the laws of the United States. He was basically what we think of today as the Secretary of State. Plus, he basically runs all of the other, uh, all of the other departments of government, including the Department of Justice, other than the military. And so as the head of the Department of Justice, He's the guy who has to enforce the law, and he is, he is condemned as the slave catcher in chief. And there's this riot that takes place in, in, uh, in Boston when uh, the, first, uh, the first black man is captured and allegedly is a, is a, is a, is a fugitive slave and is brought before a, a judge and a mob in Boston attacks the courthouse and frees him. And Webster took it as a personal affront that his neighbors in Boston would defy him and defy the law. And the next time this happens, he sends the military to enforce the law and to, and to basically, you know, hundreds of soldiers escorting uh, a, a fugitive, alleged fugitive onto a slave ship. Was that Anthony Burns? It's Anthony Burns. And, and, and that he was, I think, working as a waiter. See, in a restaurant, it's just incredible to think of the impact that that had on Bostonians, where they are literally seeing this beloved uh, member of their community serving the meals, uh, socializing in limited ways with them, literally being carried away in chains and put on a boat. That strikes me as being one of the most galvanizing moments of exactly. Northern interest and, and uh, participation. Exactly, right. Exactly. I mean, and it wasn't just people who were in fact fugitives because basically any black person, male or female, could be picked up off the street and someone could say, I own her, you know? And all of a sudden you have this, you have this kangaroo court where they order them on a slave ship. And it happened not just in Boston, but all over the North. And so all over the North, you have this, this outrage of, of Northerners thinking like, what is going on here? Up to that moment in time, slavery was something that happened you know, far, far away. It's like the way we think about child labor in Bangladesh. You know, We might think it's a terrible thing, but we don't have to see it. We don't have to face it every day. When you face it every, when you see this outrage taking place, that is what pushes public opinion in the North into the anti-slavery column. Had there been no compromise, would there have been a civil war? You know, it's always hard to know uh, what would ha happen, but but probably I think most historians would agree that the country would have fallen apart in 1850. And, and um, we would be a very different country today. Uh, there might have been a civil war anyway, because the issue of fugitive slavery would have still continued, right? There, Fugitive slaves would have continued to cross the border, and the South would demand the return of those slaves, and maybe we'd have to have some sort of treaty. And if we didn't agree to a treaty, maybe there would have been border skirmishes or something like that might have happened. Uh, it's hard to say. But with the one thing that the 1850 Compromise did, uh, and many, many historians before me have said that um, you know, the 1850 Compromise was a terrible thing. Uh, Webster was a terrible man for agreeing to it. And the 1850 Compromise did nothing ultimately to, to, uh, to avert the Civil War. And I disagree with that very strongly because the 10 years between 1850 and 1860 were critical in saving the Union in the following respect. First of all, as I said, Northern public opinion shifted dramatically towards the anti-slavery column. In 1850, the Free Soil Party ran uh, and they got only 10% of the vote. That was the anti-slavery party at the time. By 1860, you have Lincoln elected heading the Republican Party, which has an anti-slavery uh, platform. Secondly, in that 10 years intervening, um, you had, uh, 
really dramatic changes in the economy of the North. The North became much more industrialized, much wealthier than the South. We were building weapons. We were building the weapons, right. Connecticut became probably the largest producer of weapons in the world, military weapons in the world. Uh, uh, the South, for some reason that I cannot understand, they abandoned their armories, they abandoned their weapon constructions. They had really nothing. They had very little gunpowder, very few weapons. Um, we had an enormously, uh, a much larger military advantage over the South by 1860 than we did in 1850. Uh, and moreover, in 1850, if we had gone to war in 1850, Millard Fillmore would be occupying the place of Abraham Lincoln, and Millard Fillmore was no Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you know, Millard Fillmore could, uh, Millard Fillmore, before he was president, was the comptroller of New York State. He didn't do that job so well. Uh, he was not capable of, of holding the union together. He did not have the political, uh, or intellectual, or character to be able to make the union what Lincoln did in 1860. So for all those reasons, I believe the Compromise of 1850 ultimately made possible the saving of the Union. And I, I believe you also argue that in that 10-year period, uh, there was a, a building up of, uh, of American, of a sense of America, of American pride. And that we can attribute to, to the oratory of Webster. So kids in school were talking about liberty and, uh, and, and being Americans in a way that sort of, it, it, it led to um, a support of support. Right, well, what happened was, you know, um, some of you maybe remember the McGuffey readers, uh, but the, uh, in, in, um, uh, in the 19th century, not that you're from the 19th century, but, the, but in the 19th century, um, Pierpont and McGuffey were the two major readers that kids read in school. And, and with the spread of public education, every kid in America would read from these books, one of these books. Both of these books were written to basically secularize education. So rather than reading excerpts of the Bible, as previously had been the case, people were reading speeches of, of, of famous Americans, primarily Daniel Webster's speeches. Daniel Webster's speeches were part of those readers. And kids would be expected to stand up in school and recite from memory excerpts of his most famous speeches, including, of course, the line, liberty and union now and forever, one and inseparable. And so everyone who went to war in 1860, on both the North and the Southern side, was, was steeped in this notion that we are American, that the Constitution made us Americans, and that we are, that, that it is the union that makes us free. How did how did Webster live out his final days? Uh, mostly in a stupor. Uh, he was he was a drunk. Uh, Webster, for all of his uh, political accomplishments, was not a very um, excuse me, sir. Uh, the he was uh, he was a uh, you know he was a guy who had um, an, uh, an excessive fondness for liquor, uh, women. And money, um, and uh, he lived far beyond his his uh, his capacity uh, by basically doing favors for some of his constituents, um, some of the great industrialists of of New England, who would give him money in exchange for which he would then you know work to uh, get tariffs to protect their businesses and so forth, and. He, uh, he couldn't afford this, this huge plantation he built on, on, in Marshfield. Um, he was constantly in debt. He, was, he had scandalous affairs with lots of women. Um, uh, and he was a drunk. Um, and uh, after, the, after the, um, the compromise of 1850, he really couldn't, he couldn't hold it together any longer. And... Uh, he he um, he was still Secretary of State. He went back to Marshfield and and died there, um, presumably from cirrhosis of the liver. Mm -hmm. So so he came into public uh, acclaim and uh, ultimately notoriety at a time when America was divided uh, in many ways that one might say we are divided today. 
what would Webster say about where we are as an American people today? Right. Well, I, um, you know, I, um, I, uh, I, I tried in this book um, to talk about some of our recent events without talking about some of our recent events. And um, uh, Webster lived in a time that was no less polarized than our own time, uh, uh, in which uh, the country was threatened in a different way, but, but our democracy was threatened then, as it, I think it is today. Uh, and um, Webster, I think, managed to, to transform our ideas of being an American by appealing to our history, by, you know, by appealing to our heritage, um, by arguing the importance and the centrality of the Constitution in defining us as, as citizens. And, and I think that that's the lesson of this book um, that I hope some people will take to heart. So that you also you see one of the you also the other part of it is that I think that, that Webster recognized uh, the importance of compromise, and um, he said something, and I will try to quote this from memory, but I won't do a good job. He said something about um, the abolitionists, which I think has some relevance today. He said that um, you know uh, these these people um, think about morality as if it were mathematics, as if you could distinguish right from wrong uh, with the precision of an algebraic equation. Uh, and he goes on to say that um, they will look at a spot on the sun and they will be prepared to strike the sun out of the heavens. They would rather live in utter darkness rather than in heavenly light. Uh, and I think that, um, I think both sides of the debates today uh, need to take that to heart and to recognize the importance of, of trying to find some consensus and compromise. So if you were asked, and I'll ask it now, how is Webster's life and how is this book relevant today? Well, I think it's relevant because I think that, uh, I, as I said, I think, it, I think it, it, it basically is a book about the importance of trying to find compromise. And it takes a great deal of courage to compromise. Daniel Webster gave up his political career to save the union. Uh, I think that you know people on both sides of the debate uh, need to be prepared to make sacrifices um, uh, if it's net, if if we're going to be able to hold our democracy together. I, I think that's that's the importance of this. And would he think that our democracy, or would you think that our democracy is under the threat that some say it is? Well, I, I, I think our democracy, I mean, I'm speaking out myself as a constitutional law professor. Uh, I, I, I think that our democracy is very much under, under threat today. Um, I, I think that uh, the uh, 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 January 6 um, uh, riots, um, insurrection, attempted insurrection, uh, demonstrate to us the fragility of our democracy and the fact that uh, we were basically saved by the courage of some Capitol Hill police officers and by our vice president and a few other individuals who did the right thing. Um, but I don't know how much we can depend on that in the future. I'm particularly troubled by the fact that we live at a time when there is increasing um, disrespect or, or a, a lack of uh, the, the Supreme Court has is losing its legitimacy, particularly in light of the recent scandals that have come out. The Supreme Court, for better or worse, is sort of the last stop in our democracy. They're the last ones who who have the the who might have the authority to stop a president from doing what Mr. Trump attempted to do uh, to hold on to power. And if the Supreme Court isn't there, if they don't have that kind of weight any legitimacy any longer, uh, then I think we are in great, great danger. Is there a happier note in which we could uh, end this conversation? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, let's see what the questions are. Let's see, maybe maybe someone will have a happy note here. Joel, thank you very much. And um, uh, we're now we're now uh, ready for questions. So you can uh, you said that he was the greatest orator of the 19th century, and I think some people would say, "What about Abraham Lincoln?" And um, I'd love to hear you compare and contrast uh, their speaking styles and why, you know, you think that he was the greatest of them. Right. Thank you so much for that question. I, I love talking about the comparison of these two guys because, you know, today most of us think of Lincoln that way. <clears throat> Um, Lincoln himself would say, not out of modesty, but just as a factual matter, Lincoln would have said um, that his model uh, for oratory was Daniel Webster. Um, Lincoln was a terrible orator. He was a brilliant man. He was a great writer. Uh, his speeches read very eloquently. But first of all, he had a <clears throat> he had a, a very high squeaky voice. It didn't, he didn't project well at all. Um, people came to the Lincoln Douglas debates. They didn't hear a word he said, <laughs> but they came because it was an event, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a happening. Um, uh, and so he just simply couldn't convey his thoughts as well as, as Webster could. Um, and if you compare his speeches and, and, and Lincoln's and Webster's speeches, one of the things that's striking is that some of the lines that we think of today as Lincoln's greatest lines were lifted from Webster. So when Lincoln says that, you know, that we're a, kind of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, he doesn't even have to say, and I'm quoting, Ab and I'm quoting Daniel Webster, because everybody in the audience knows, oh yeah, that's Daniel Webster. They read that in school. They heard that line in school. So, so Lincoln basically used Webster's speeches. And in fact, he didn't even have to have copies of Webster's speeches because he knew them by heart. So when, when, when Lincoln was drafting the Gettysburg Address, he, he, he basically picked out parts of Webster's speeches from his, uh, the, the second reply to Senator Hayne and, and use them in, in the Gettysburg Address. And he didn't need to go look, check a reference source because he knew this by heart. Frederick Douglass was also thrown in the ring as another option for the best order um, in the comments but he here. he came much later, actually. Uh, uh, Daniel Webster dies in 1852. Frederick Douglass' you know, fame as an orator sort of starts in the 18, you know, by, by the 1850s, certainly. Um, but, but Webster sort of peaks like 1830, 1820 to 1835. We have a question from Jim that asks, what was Webster's role in the nullification crisis of 1832? What was Webster's role in the, ex in the nullification, nullification crisis. crisis of 18, 18, I'm sorry? 32. 1832. Um, so uh, uh, just, just to get everybody on the same page here. So uh, um, uh, Daniel Webb's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Andrew Jackson is president uh, in 1832. Um, Congress passes a tariff that is, um, that some people in the South thinks is discriminatory to the South. Uh, South Carolina threatens to refuses to enforce it or to, to, to apply the tariff uh, and threatens to secede. They said that they have the power to nullify the tariff. Um, it, is, it is Webster who helps to kind of persuade Jackson, who was always a critic of federal power and, and the federal government. I haven't even gotten to Andrew Jackson. Uh, uh, Andrew Jackson is... Um, uh, is the most Trumpian figure you could imagine. Is Trump on steroids, uh, and 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 he is he is a guy who is uh, he gets elected to office um, with without any real political background or a party affiliation. He gets elected to office running on a platform that he is going to clean out the Augean stables to drain the swamp. 
Uh, and he is and he is running on a on a, a vendetta basically he says that he has he's been unfairly cheated out of the presidency in 1824 by john quincy adams because of a corrupt bargain that uh, jackson falsely claims has taken place between henry clay and john quincy adams uh, and so he gets elected to office and he's determined to clean out the swamp by firing all of these well-meaning federal workers who were perfectly competent, honest, hardworking people, and replacing them with these incompetent, dishonest cronies, who then proceed to steal millions of dollars from the federal treasury. Um, and and, and, and uh, Jackson does all of this. And then in the midst of this, South Carolina is threatening to secede. And, and Webster basically sort of stands up and, and basically says, uh, you know, we're one union, you can't secede. He rejects the nullification crisis. That's the significance of the, 19th, of the 1830 um, uh, second reply to Senator Hayne. And, and Jackson, who's vice president, John Calhoun, is the guy who is the author of the nullification crisis. He's the, he's the source of the nullification crisis. And, and Jackson finally has to stand up to Calhoun and join party with, with Webster. And so Webster's kind of the guy who, who holds Jackson's feet to the fire and gets Jackson to stand up to South Carolina and say, no, uh, you cannot see, we're not going to let that happen. And we're prepared to use the military, if necessary, to crush any secessions. And South Carolina backs down. We're out of time. We, we can continue the conversation in here, uh, but I think we have to let the folks online go. So everyone, thank you very much for coming. There are books for sale outside. And for those joining online, we encourage you to buy Indivisible at your local bookstore. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Joe Paul.